welcome to the vent room where respiratory therapists can come and get a little inspiration. I'm your host, Dr. Tabitha Dragonberry. Our guest today is going to be Kurt Merriman. He is the Chief Sales Officer at RT Now, which is essentially the first turnkey respiratory therapy telehealth solution that I'm personally aware of. Um, I think it's an innovative way to bring respiratory therapy farther into the digital age. Kurt, can you tell me a little bit about how the idea of RT Now came about? Oh, absolutely. Tabitha, thank you for um, having me today. I appreciate the opportunity and, and what you're doing with uh, the Ventrum. Um, so back in 2016, um, as you mentioned, I'm a respiratory therapist. Uh, myself and some of my other business colleagues uh, we're getting a request from our respiratory therapy staffing company to uh, help staff rural hospitals and healthcare institutions uh, when they'd have new admissions for COPD years uh, going through an exacerbation. And unfortunately, we did not have therapists just readily available to jump in their car and drive three and a half hours to uh, go see those patients and then drive back home. So we came up with the idea, well, why can't we utilize the respiratory therapist's critical thinking skills and our unique skill set in a telehealth format um, to, to provide our knowledge in consultation uh, remotely via a, a virtual video chat. So um, we initiated uh, some of our planning and in August of 2016, we um, opened up our first pilot in a small town in southwestern Minnesota, Sleepy Eye and initiated uh, with a critical access hospital there, um, RT Now Telehealth. And we were there for about four and a half months uh, during that pilot project and found uh, success and basically um, uh, acknowledged our uh, concept was actually uh, possible and achievable. That sounds amazing. I know there's several types of telehealth. Um, you have provider to consumer, provider to provider, and remote monitoring solutions. With that, yours is more of a provider to provider or also that provider to patient? Well, so we're actually more of the, the, the live video conferencing uh, asynchronous mode. Uh, at this point in time, uh, we are primarily working directly with institutions, whether they be uh, small critical access hospitals or skilled facilities that do not have respiratory therapists either available to them uh, 24 hours a day. And in some cases, uh, they just do not have respiratory therapists available to them at all. Uh, we are not, uh, we don't intend, uh, nor do we think that we can replace uh, the boots on the ground, so to speak, of a respiratory therapist. But uh, we have a significant shortage, as uh, I think all of us are aware of respiratory therapy uh, personnel across the country, and especially in rural America to, uh, to recruit and retain individuals is a challenge. Uh, so most of our work is done uh, as at live video conferencing. Uh, we are uh, communicating and, and working with the nurse or the provider at the bedside, as well as speaking with the patient. Um, at this point in time, we are not in the home setting, although there are some new avenues coming about with the remote patient monitoring that you had mentioned with some codes that may allow that to be a more successful uh, advantage for, for telerespiratory to actually be seeing these patients in their homes to help uh, eliminate hospital readmissions or at least reduce them. So with the goal of using evidence-based practice, we're always focused on those outcomes. What have the outcomes been for the RT Now services? Actually, we were, you know, when we first got into this, we weren't quite sure uh, what we would come up with. And what we found is even during that first pilot study of the four and a half months, uh, that particular hospital identified, uh, the nurses identified uh, themselves, three patients that they would have transferred out um, that they were able to keep because they utilized RT Now, the telerespiratory therapist, to help them uh, achieve successful non-invasive ventilation on patients and keep them there at the hospital and not having to transport them out. Which is great for, you know, that small rural community because then they're keeping the, the money within their organization and not having to ship those patients out. Exactly. And it's not only the, just the, the money, but the, the, the community hospitals really play an integral part of that community. I mean, they're typically one of the larger uh, employers within that community. 
and uh, they have family members that they're taking care of. And uh, one of the examples uh, that, that we talk about in some of our case studies is that it happened over the Christmas holiday. And that COPD patient that exacerbated was able to be kept there on site at their local hospital. The family was able to visit them uh, without having to travel 60 plus miles uh, to a larger tertiary care facility. And that, again, goes to that like holistic care of taking care of not just the patient, but the family and, and keeping them within their community because they feel safe. Exactly. Is there, uh, with your services... Are they being sought out by organizations now? Are there organizations saying, hey, we are needing to fill in these gaps? You know, it, it is starting to to occur that way. Uh, because as you had mentioned, we were, we believe the, the first very specific telerestory providers uh, in the marketplace starting back in 2016. And it's it's taken a few years just to get people aware of it. And we're now actually getting some organic uh, word of mouth uh, growth with people hearing uh, about the service and about telehealth uh, being able to be provided uh, for respiratory therapy uh, patients and, and that. So it's uh, it's starting to come come through and, and uh, we're happy to see that. It's, it's been exciting. So on your team, how many respiratory therapists do you have at a time or, or taking care of these remote patients? Oh, great question. Tell this. So we have 21 respiratory therapists that are providing services 24-7, 365 for our team now. Those uh, 21 therapists are typically working in point positions in various hospitals and then do extra uh, above and beyond time working with our team now and, and their, the telehealth aspect of it. We do have a couple people that are uh, going to school and uh, RT now is their primary uh, employment as well. Uh, we at this point in time with our call volumes, we typically have one therapist on at a time to to cover the calls that may be uh, coming in. But we do have redundancy and backup plans uh, in place. So if there's multiple calls occurring at once, that uh, we have other therapists uh, that we can make available to uh, initiate and and take those video chat calls. In doing some research for this show, I found like the uh, an American Academy of Ambulatory Nursing has a telehealth certification. I also found that there was like a certification for telehealth coordinators. Just like any profession, there are different organizations such as the American Telemedicine Association that also accredit courses. Do you believe that RTs could have their own telehealth certification one day? I definitely think so. It does take a unique set of skills to uh, successfully do telehealth as a respiratory therapist. It's it's a, a different type of patient care uh, where we're used to being the hands-on in the room, can uh, see, talk to the patient, you know, be able to assess what's happening uh, in the whole environment just by walking into the room. And it does take a, a little bit additional training that we provide for our staff on heightening their awareness of being observant when they're asking the nurse to uh, move the, uh, we're, we're using an iPad on a stand, but uh, moving that around the room so we have a, a good view of the patient environment, the patient, the monitoring, what's going on uh, and the surroundings there. And then heightening their communication skills to asking uh, more in-depth discerning questions so that we can get a, a better picture. Uh, we'll typically also have the ability to remote into the facility's EMR to get histories and that. But when we're dealing with the emergency department where there's not a lot of time involved and it's more of a just-in-time, we need your your assistance right now, uh, we're doing a lot of communication with the, the nurse and the provider and, and the patient right there in the room. So with that experience and education, if there is a respiratory therapist that's kind of looking at this as an option for their career track. What do they need to be doing now? What education or any additional skills that they could be growing now so that they can say, you know what, in one or two years, maybe my old bones or can't do the, the floor care anymore, or, or just, you know, people want to have that option of working from home, because I know on social media, I, I've seen questions about that. And people are always like, you know, I, uh, I'm looking to transition. What can I do as an RT from home? Um, what skills do they need to start growing now? Sure. 
You know, there there is information with uh, you had mentioned the American um, Telehealth Association and and some others that that have information about kind of enhancing your 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 skill set. Uh, it's still something that's relatively new because telehealth is still a very new uh, field in in healthcare for for us and specifically uh, for respiratory therapists. Uh, one of the things that I can encourage is. Uh, if you do go to our website, uh, we do have a, a, a section on there called the Artinol Bullpen. And basically, it's a, a community um, where people can uh, kind of talk with one another, learn a little bit more about telehealth. Uh, there's also uh, a LinkedIn um, uh, area, uh, which is just under telerespiratory, that again is not specific to Artinol, but is just for anybody interested, for colleagues and peers to. Uh, discuss uh, amongst themselves and get ideas, share ideas, and hopefully, as as that community grows and people that are doing uh, more of the telehealth themselves can be sharing uh, their experiences also through that to to get the backgrounds. And I and I do th see that we'll we'll uh, find more certifications uh, coming available. My aunt is a remote nurse case manager, and she holds licenses in. I think like 14 different states where she manages cases. How does the licensure work for the RT now therapists? You know, very similarly, there's really not at this point in time a, a telehealth reciprocity for uh, a therapist to see patients in uh, different states without requiring uh, them to to seek those licensures. So. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a staff of about 21. Uh, the majority of our therapists have multiple state licensures. And when we uh, enter into a new state, uh, we'll not only have our therapists gain uh, a license for that state, but we'll also do recruitment uh, within that state itself of therapists that uh, are currently working there. And that's part of what the, the bullpen is, is all about, is just kind of prepping as, as, uh, as things grow and expand right now, our company is in Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, Missouri, uh, soon to be Michigan. And as we gain more states, uh, we're actively recruiting and looking for therapists that have an interest and have the skill sets that, that we feel are, are important. So I know that you were saying that in your education, you're kind of focusing on that heightened communication and being able to observe differently because you're not in that environment. What kind of education and training and hardware supplied to somebody that is a new hire as you, your company's expanding? Oh, great question. So we have uh, online training that we've put together that uh, when we have a therapist that we vetted and we feel that, that uh, both they and, and our leadership team feels like it's a good fit, uh, they are sent a, a link for some online uh, training and education, which is uh, just some some basic information. You know, it, it can be some things as simple as, you know, what is the lighting like in the room that you're going to be doing uh, your your video chatting, uh, the, your telehealth conferences, uh, making sure that it's it's HIPAA compliant, PHI compliant, so that it's in a uh, a secluded area, at least an area that can be closed off, so that uh, people aren't hearing uh, information that they shouldn't be hearing or seeing it as well. Um, just kind of the, I think I mentioned uh, the the lighting, uh, speaker sound, that type of thing, just to, from the technical aspect, make sure that uh, everything looks professional, sounds, and, and uh, is professional from, from that standpoint. Uh, so they go through that, that training, some uh, uh, education on some of the, you know, communication skills to uh, help heighten their, their uh, questions that they might be asking. And then they do one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Uh, the the um, everything that we do is is uh, web-based or browser-based. So uh, they get their um, our system set up on, on their computers, and then we do some one-on-one -on -one training just to make sure that they're comfortable. Everything is functioning. They know how to navigate uh, things through. Uh, one of the things that we do is because the therapists obviously have at set foot in the, any of these institutions, is when we onboard a, a customer, uh, we're seeking information from an internal champion at that facility to give us information on the respiratory equipment that they're using, any of their respiratory medications, what the, what's in their formulary. So when the therapist 
is seeing that patient, we're making recommendations based on the equipment, the best practices that they have in place, any protocols they have in place, that type of thing. Uh, so we're functioning just as if we were there on site. I can imagine it in my head. I think it's like just the next step. You kind of think like Star Trek. You're going where no respiratory therapist has ever gone before. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> oh, that, that's a great analogy. That's fun. <laughs> you know, because I'm ju I'm just imagining just having to work through that, and you're seeing a patient and caring for them from however many either thousands of miles away or hundreds of miles away, and that you're impacting and affecting the care and the facility's happy to have you there and they're 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 wanting to have you there even though you aren't physically there correct most of the times uh you know there's oftentimes skepticism within the organization when they first start with with our telerespiratory service and uh many times the the nurses are wondering well how can you actually do this and really be of service to us uh via you know your video chat and it, Pretty much after a nurse's experience or a provider's experience the calls, the comments that we get are, wow, I didn't realize how much you could actually do via a video chat and helping me at the bedside and just giving me the confidence that I needed to, to care for that patient in that crucial time when oftentimes they're, you know, they're, they're increasing the work of breathing, you know, they're, they're dysmic, they're just having a, a, a terrible time. And the the amount of stress in that scenario is uh, oftentimes quite high, and uh, we can just help alleviate that with the therapist right there, uh, walking them through things. Can you walk me through like a consult one of the RT now therapists may encounter? Sure. So the the two primary types of calls that we've experienced since we've started this is uh, one uh, a new new respiratory therapist or new respiratory patient being admitted to the facility. And uh, the telerespiratory therapist performing a an RCAP, a respiratory care assess and treat, um, or however you might term it. Each facility kind of maybe determine them or name them a little bit differently. But uh, basically, we're we're reviewing the medical record, looking at what their histories are, what the medications they've been on, uh, their eyes and nose, uh, their current status, X-rays. Um, all the all that type of information from a clinical standpoint, just like you would be as a therapist in the facility, reviewing that before you go into the room. We then ask the, the nurse, okay, let's go ahead and bring us in the room via the our technology and uh, arrange the iPad so that we can uh, communicate easily with the patient and have a discussion with them, find out occupational exposures, just like you would if you were walking in the room. Um, most of the time, at, at this point in time, we're relying on the nurses' uh, auscultation techniques. And one of the things that our therapists are doing is uh, asking, again, a lot of discerning questions. Uh, as many of us know, that one person's definition of a wheeze is not the same as the next person sitting uh, by them. So the therapists are asking some really discerning questions about what that, that wheeze or that particular breath sound actually sounded like to determine you know, what it is that they're looking for. Uh, there are technologies for Bluetooth uh, stethoscopes that uh, we've done some evaluation on and we'll probably be deploying fairly soon, actually. Uh, but in the meantime, we're just relying on, on the, the nurses' uh, communication with us and what, what they're hearing. And we'll then make our recommendations, chart in the medical record as if we were uh, a therapist working right there at, at the bedside and make our recommendations for... Uh, medications, treatment modalities, frequency, uh, that type of thing, any airway clearance that uh, may be required, um, supplemental oxygen, um, all those kind of, kind of things. So we all know that advances in healthcare move faster than government legislation. Where are where you guys are working now and operating, is there any government regulations that is making it easier to provide this service? Or is it just such an untapped market that we're kind of cowboys figuring it out as we go because there isn't regulations? You know, that's a great question. So, so far, there really has not been a lot of regulations uh, that we can fall under from a respiratory therapy standpoint and, and reimbursement. There, there are currently a couple of different um, 
pieces of legislation in DC, the uh, Breathe Act and the Connect Act are probably the two most prominent ones that uh, both of those acts, if they uh, get voted in, um, would allow and identify a respiratory therapist as being a telehealth provider. And that would open up some significant doors for us to be able to really take uh, what we're doing to the next level. And it also would identify that the uh, typically the patient's home would be a, a location uh, that we could be providing those services uh, to to those individuals. So again, by doing the virtual visits, we could help do that uh, chronic disease management, education, self-management care, and just ensuring that the, the patient, once they're in their home surroundings and out of the hospital um, and in their own environment, can truly learn better uh, about their disease process and how to manage it better and again help reduce the the hospital readmissions uh, there are there are some new things that have changed in this past year with remote patient monitoring uh, with some codes that uh, i think are are really going to play in into the the whole telehealth process of allowing respiratory therapists to be a, a, por a part of that and seeking out and uh, obtaining data from the patient that we can use as early indications for uh, them going into having some difficulties and trying to uh, hit them before, you know, contact them before they're uh, being rushed to the emergency room. With some of those acts, I know previously that they required a, a bachelor's degree. Do you know the ones that are currently pushing through with the connector breathe? Is it saying that that respiratory therapist needs to have a bachelor's degree to be considered for the reimbursement purposes? Well, you know, neither of those acts have, have uh, because they haven't been passed yet into, into law, uh, those kind of regulations and rules will be written after the fact. Uh, but what we do know is that typically for any type of uh, reimbursement from a healthcare professional, uh, the, the standard of practice is to have a bachelor's of science uh, degree, whether it's specifically in respiratory therapy, or it may be just a, a bachelor of science and some other uh, health-related uh, degree along with the respiratory therapy uh, diploma that they have and, and uh, degree as well. So uh, those details have not been worked out, but it's pretty much a standard of practice that, that it would require a bachelor's of science or greater, master's, uh, PhD, that type of thing. So I know a while back, I actually took a telehealth course and the professor mentioned a company that was in New Zealand and they hired American doctors, relocated them overseas to provide telemedicine in the U.S. Um, because when it's nighttime in the U.S., it's daytime in New <laughs> Zealand. So the whole thought process and their promotion was that you're always going to get that fresh doctor versus the doctor, you know, waking somebody up in the middle of the night and, you know, we, we should be sleeping naturally. I know that night shift has wreaked some havoc on my body. So what do you think on, on that whole aspect of that innovative, you know, we're taking telehealth and now it's an even totally different innovative thought. Well, you know, that's actually quite interesting. And, and I've read about some of that as well. And it, it does make some good sense uh, to be able to do that. A lot of it is really going to, going to come down to the, the logistics and the reimbursement and the, the, the fiscal ability to, to make that happen. Um, you know, because we are, we are a global uh, world now, uh, we could be providing those kind of services with providers here in the United States for people on the other side of the world. Again, that would be the day shift there, night shift here, or vice versa. And um, it could work out uh, quite well. We've actually, so far with our experiences uh, with the, the, the therapists that are sometimes being woken up in the middle of the night, uh, we have not had uh, areas of concern with that. Uh, the vast majority of the calls seem to come in more on uh, evening and uh, day shift and on, on weekends, uh, some on the night shift, but not as many as I think we initially anticipated. That's interesting to know because I feel like, you know, 
I don't know, when I've worked night shift, 2 a.m. seems to be the magic hour. <laughs> well, uh, that when we do the, get the nighttime calls, that's about the time that they do come through. You are correct. I think it's interesting how those types of trends, you notice them when you've been working in the industry for a while. Yes, exactly. Kurt, thank you for joining us here at the Vent Room. It's great to see our T's are making strides in telehealth and being successful and showing that there are other opportunities and that we can move, you know, to the bedside, but in a digital perspective. Well, thank you. I, I have been a respiratory therapist for 40 years and still believe that this profession offers many opportunities. And uh, the telehealth is now one of the newest ones that I think is, is certainly in, in going to be in the forefront for many years to come. And I appreciate uh, you reaching out to me and taking the time to uh, chat about telerespiratory and, and how RG is going to definitely take a part care of our patients in a unique way. Thank you, Kurt.